Hello and welcome everyone to this special Christmas edition of CTO Craft Bites. Um, for those of you that haven't attended one of these events before or maybe don't even know what CTO Craft is about, let me just give you a, a one minute introduction. Uh, so CTO Craft is a community of CTOs, uh, senior engineering managers and other technology leaders. Uh, membership's free and this gives access to a, a Slack group and some resources. Uh, also, we offer a number of educational and support services such as uh, CTO coaching, mentoring circles and some uh, leadership development activities. So if you're not already a member, then uh, please go to ctocraft.com and uh, have a look around and, and see if you'd like to sign up. We'd be happy to see you there. There's already over 7,000 people, so it's, it's a great uh, resource. Um, so special thanks also to our headline partner, AWS, who, who make these Bytes events possible. Uh, just a, a brief introduction for me. So I'm Dan Smith. I'm one of the CTO Craft coaches. Um, over 25 years of experience and the grey hairs to prove it. Um, but today's not, not about me. It's about my guest, Ryan Singer. So he's ex-Basecamp. Uh, he was head of strategy there for 18 years and over 20 years of, of full-stack development experience, including UI and code. So Ryan, would you like to, to say hello to everyone? Uh, hi, thanks a lot for having me here. Nice to uh, nice to be here with you all. Excellent. So uh, a few like housekeeping things. We don't need to worry about the fire alarm. That's lucky. But we'd like to to ask your uh, answer your questions. So up at least for me on the top right, there's a, a QA section, uh, a little tab there. Hopefully you'll see it. So please do start posting your questions and and vote on the ones you like, and I will try to, to manage there and, and, and pick out some of the most popular and uh, what I consider interesting, I have some kind of editorial capacity. But yeah, we'd love to answer some of your questions because then we, we're sure that they're the ones that are the most relevant. Um, so Ryan, uh, shape up, stop running in circles and ship work that matters. So tell us, what were the key challenges you were facing that uh, caused you to devise this method? Do we call it a method? Well, I think um, uh, something like that. Uh, I, I think it's a handful of of, of big ideas, uh, and then uh, I think that they actually kind of lead us down toward working out. You know, I think method is something a bit more tactical, you know. And here, I think uh, it's it's actually a handful of big ideas that might make us think differently about the major phases of development. And mm -hmm. the the motivation behind it was actually, I think, the thing that that so many of us go through. I was in the same place for 18 years and saw a lot of changes from, you know, those early days when it's three people around a table and everything just happens automatically by magic by itself. You don't have to coordinate. You don't have to have process. Things just happen. And then there is a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of an expansion of that core where things still are kind of still happening more or less uh, by osmosis, right? But then you get to a point beyond 10, 12 people where you start to f realize that things don't happen the way that they used to. And we have to slowly start to introduce a little bit of process. And then going from 10 to 12, you know, up to 50, 60 people, it starts to feel quite different, right? And as we went through all of those different changes, you know, being in the same, being in the same team and seeing that growth, saw a lot of the challenges that a lot of other companies have. Like, for example, the feeling like, why is it that we used to be able to kind of make decisions throughout the course of a product development effort so that it never sort of spiraled out of control, but it somehow finished when we intended to finish it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how, how is it that we can, as we start to grow, avoid having the old work always being in the way of the new work? You know, there's this kind of long tail of leftover things that are somehow in our way of taking on the new thing. And especially, how do we keep the context and keep the intent of the original kind of pitch of that mm -hmm. thing that the thing that we were going to go after, you know, from an experience point of view, from a business point of view, how do we actually keep the intent of that thing intact throughout the whole process instead of kind of running it through the paper shredder where it turns into a whole bunch of tickets. And then we all pray that on the last day, they're going to integrate together into, into something that works really well, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are, the, those, are the, those are the kind of problems that actually we were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And so if we, 
I mean, it might not be a direct comparison, but if we consider some of the existing method methodology, such as Scrum or Kanban, did you try any of those and find that they weren't up to it, or you know, what did you maybe did you deliberately look to do something differently? How, how did what was the genesis process? Yeah, I I grew up kind of immersed in classic old school agile, uh, in a small a agile, you know, and mm -hmm. was a. a, a by working closely with David, when you know David was the first technical person at Basecamp, he created Ruby on Rails and and everything like that. And uh, through through him, I got introduced to Kent Beck and Martin Fowler and all of those guys. And what I saw was, you know, a lot of really really great stuff on the level of principles. For example, the key idea of fixed time variable scope was something mm -hmm. that that we took very seriously very early on. Um, but what I started to see around me was that every time I looked at what other companies were doing, the more that they started to adopt a kind of formalized agile or scrum type of a process, the the more, how do I say this? It's actually like the less integration was happening from mm -hmm. a product standpoint, from a business standpoint. There was one chance, you know, oddly enough, I know it, it may be like, uh, you know, impolite to say this or whatever, but oddly enough, it felt more and more waterfall than anything because mm -hmm. there was kind of this, this one chance to get together a lot of design at the beginning before it went over to some technical people who would then split it out into different uh, tickets or something like that, you know, which would go through grooming sessions. And so the first kind of big problem that I saw around me was, you know, this kind of splitting out the work and, and, then, and then kind of treating it as if it was orthogonal and modular much too early uh, mm -hmm. meant that actually mm -hmm. there was no chance for, for for product and business to to make trade-offs and to participate in the evolution of that work, and uh, and the other thing was that you know in theory the the two week sprint thing kind of sounds like it means that you're going to be able to move and change a lot, but in practice it's actually really hard to get anything substantial done in in a two week period, and so what happens is you kind of start to it's a little bit like running while looking at your feet, you know it's it's very hard to kind of define what is a what is a larger outcome look like that we're trying to get to that's bigger than two weeks and what are the design decisions that actually are above the level of that two week sprint how do, mm -hmm. how, how did those where do those design decisions happen and how is this thing going to come together and so what what i was often seeing was that the natural tendency is that you know uh, projects would get another two weeks and another two weeks and another two weeks and there wouldn't be a kind of cohesive guiding direction that was constraining it. There weren't any containing walls, you know, mm -hmm. around these series of sprints. And then before you know it, you know, the project is six months in, a year in, and nobody had ever asked the question of really, how much time did we actually intend to spend on this in the beginning, you know? Mm -hmm. And 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 all of this uh, spiraling of scope that's happening did we design this into the process? You know, when did we when did we actually consider that? So, for example, one of the things that is uh, very, very different about the way of working uh, that that eventually codified in shape up was that um, there's much less of an emphasis on estimates and much mm -hmm. more of an emphasis on what we call appetite. And the appetite is a, is a strategic question of how much time do we actually want to spend on this effort from a business standpoint, from a cost standpoint, from a complexity standpoint. And then once we have understood actually what this is worth, then we actually give ourselves a design problem, you know, mm -hmm. of what could we come up with, which is a piece of work that's actually going to be doable and valuable within that time box, right? And then we start to become very intentional about what, what the overall kind of outcomes and kind of what the hip bone to the leg bone, you know, how, how the work connects. We have a kind of a higher level picture of what that work is before we actually start um, giving it to people to go build. And it means actually that we can be, so this process is actually what uh, in the book is called shaping, you know, and it refers yeah. to actually kind of making trade-offs and making some judgments and putting up some guardrails around what the work is and what it isn't before just jumping into the level of, of execution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really great point about the um, value. It's, just, it's so easy with sprints to keep going and end up as, I don't know, you've done 10 sprints and then, not have any value and then realize well actually maybe it wasn't a good idea to have got this far so i think that's a really important point and it's hard because there is a kind of uh, hidden assumption 
with uh, the way that sprint planning happens that you that you can treat all of the work as being individual and 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 independent you know mm -hmm. and so it's very hard when does that moment come to to make a trade off and if you look at the rituals of scrum the main ritual is the is the daily stand up and mm -hmm. the daily stand up mm -hmm. is is isn't actually deep enough it doesn't go deep into a a question of what is worthwhile and what's the unexpected thing we ran into and actually coming up with a design decision about how to deal with the unexpected. It's mm -hmm. sprint, you know, Scrum would actually work in, in a universe where everything was known up front. Scrum would be perfect, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, also, so uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in a situation where everything was known, then you could just, you could just create the IKEA instructions of how to assemble the parts, you know, and everyone could just follow the instructions and everything would be fine. The other thing that's a big conflating factor is that this world of uh, two week sprints and tickets and so on is actually a really, really good world to be in when you are not dealing with, with, with project work, with feature mm -hmm. work, but when you're dealing mm -hmm. with reactive work, when you're putting mm -hmm. out fires, when you're trying to prioritize all of those little things that kind of need attention ASAP, if you have some kind of capacity for dealing with all of those little things that need attention all the time, putting them through some kind of a system like that can be, can be great, you know, and a lot of the, the features of a ticketing based system make perfect sense if you're in a more of a help desk kind of a mentality. But when you are trying to really kind of integrate something that's at the feature level, um, then it's, it's very difficult to make progress there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so we have a question here about um, shape up for large projects. So obviously scrum scaling scrum is not necessarily that simple as uh, we see from having various attempts like Nexus and Safe and so on. What about shape up for, for large projects? How, how large have you seen shape up and does it, it have challenges like the other kind of, of methods of development? Well, I think actually this, this, uh, this term large project deserves some scrutiny and it's a really interesting framing because what we see in practice is that um, anytime we try to define an effort which is maybe six months long or something like that or a year long or a year and a half long we can define it directionally you know we can say that there is some kind of a product that should more or less do x y and z and this is the thing that we're pursuing but you cannot actually spec six months worth of work mm -hmm. or define six months work of work and then go start and then end up where you thought you were going to be six months later the 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 number of uncertainties are compounding uh, very, I mean, non-linearly, they're, they're intensely compounding on you. And what I've, what I've noticed anecdotally is that if a project is, is, is much longer than six weeks, actually nobody can really feel the, that deadline pushing back on them. If, if it's, it's the moment when you can actually feel the deadline coming, you know, it's like, if you have to, uh, if you have to prepare a presentation, you mm -hmm. have another week to go. But then when you have like those two days left, you start to realize like, uh oh, okay, I have to rearrange my life to make time to create this presentation, you know, <laughs> because you can feel that that pressure pushing on you that it's time to make decisions, it's time to make trade offs. And what happens is, you know, when you're in that that two week environment, of course, there's not enough time to get anything big done anyway. But if you try to do the opposite, you try to say, here's a project and it's going to be three months long or six months long. Nobody can feel what it feels like to, to have that pressure looming. And so nobody's actually making trade-offs. And what you end up doing is a lot of kind of work that seems like it might be valuable without that, without that, that, that pressure cooker of, mm -hmm. is this getting us to where we need to be? Are we going to be able to say that we did what we wanted to do? So I think the best way to approach something like, like, like a large project is to reserve, you could reserve the capacity for that six months or that year. If you say, look, this deserves, we have an appetite at a, at a, at a higher level in the company to make this the thing that we work on. But in terms of actually shaping the outcomes, what are the things that we are going to be able to click on that are going to work at the end mm -hmm. of a period of time? Mm -hmm. Something like six weeks is going to be closer to the right size where we, where we can actually kind of see all the way to the end of that time box. And it's not just something where most of the information is lost over the horizon. So I, I would actually treat it as a design problem. How can we design the first six weeks of this effort so mm -hmm. that they're going to get us to the most important first pieces that we need? 
And then how do we design based on what we learn, what works and what doesn't work and which unknowns come up? How can we then kind of design and shape what the next six weeks look like and so on? And so that's kind of what the uh, what a shape up based approach looks like. Of mm -hmm. course, there's also a big difference in terms of whether or not you have an existing architecture or if you're doing something that is totally greenfield. And here, um, no kind of delivery methodology, whether it be Scrum or Shape Up or anything, is going to help you in the pure greenfield zone because it's very hard to set expectations when you don't even have a basic architecture that you're standing on. You know, so very often what it can help to do is kind of have a first phase where you have uh, almost like that early startup environment. You have a very small number of senior people who are collaborating in a very organic way to get that core architecture up. Right. And then once that core architecture is up, it's actually easier to shape projects that are more or less six mm -hmm. weeks in length that then kind of give you the different chunks of value that you need or give you the different main outcomes that you need to start to flesh that thing out. So that was that raises an interesting point then, um, and I, I mean that you've not made any suggestion that shape up is universally applicable at all. But when when do you see it as being applicable? It sounds like at the uh, very early stage, it's not necessarily relevant. But yeah, other... actually, I don't think I think mm -hmm. the uh, the language actually the language can be very helpful at all stages to talk about different types of uncertainty, to talk about whether the work is shaped or not to talk mm -hmm. about what it means to have guardrails versus latitude in the work. What does it mean to have different levels of abstraction and how the work is defined? There's a lot of things that we can bring in as kind of terminology, which is helpful. But in terms of process, the place where it really starts to become valuable is when you have an, you have a, an architecture, some architecture in place, and you have an existing architecture, you have mm -hmm. a team which is growing beyond that early core that can do things organically. And you're starting to feel like either we're, we, we feel like we're kind of in a traffic jam all the time where there isn't that, that free space to go take on new work, or there seems to be a disconnect between what we're trying to do when we talk about product and what's mm -hmm. coming out as, as, as what's getting merged into, into the main code base, you know, like what's getting deployed. When there's a disconnect between product and what's getting shipped, those are kind of good moments to say, we might actually need the the structure that's described in something like shape up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great answer. And what about um, starting off with shape up? How does someone go from I don't know whether it's chaos or whether it's perfect textbook scrum? How do you <laughs> how do you get into shape up? I mean, there's quite a lot to it, right? I mean, if, uh, if you look through, there's the the shaping, there's the betting, there's various stages. Mm -hmm. typically going from a kind of concept most people will have from the book to to actually implementing it needs time and stages how 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 do you advise people to to get started yeah so uh here the first thing i think is is to t is to take a look at first of all what is one's where is one sitting in the organization and here um uh there's going to be a difference if you are, so for example, if you're in a very, very young organization, there's going to be a lot of, of, of overlap in roles, you know, but if you're in an organization that has already started to mature a bit, you might have what feels like kind of the product department and the engineering mm -hmm. department, right? And they might mm -hmm. have different leadership and they might see the mm -hmm. organization differently. So if you are trying to, to to bring this in but you're from the product side it's going to look different than if you're trying to bring it in and you're on the engineering side right so that's the first thing to look at and um what i've seen is that people tend to either adopt from from one of two sides either they first focus on what i like to call kind of the shipping muscle which is are we able to actually take in work whether it's whether it's good work or or, or, you know, uh, last minute kind of, uh, you know, idea from the shower work, like whatever it is, are we able to take that work and actually go execute and ship it? Or, or are things, are, is everything getting tangled uh, along the way? That's one question. And another question is, um, are we actually, when we, when we give work to the team to go implement, is the work that's coming out actually what we wanted to come out? So um, what I've seen is that there's some teams are actually quite satisfied even sometimes with their existing scrum process, they say, look, yeah, there's different issues with it, but when I give them work, they, they're smart people, 
they, they, they kind of, despite the, the, the system, they collaborate with each other and they make good decisions and they're able to ship stuff. But they might notice that the problem is that there's very rarely any constraints uh, on, the, on the definition of the project. You know, that they sort of describe some outcomes that they want, but there is no containing wall of the appetite. There's no trade-offs being made about how much time do we actually want to spend on this? What's the size of the effort? What's in and what's out of the scope kind of earlier on to make this thing doable within a time that's strategically desirable? So if, if it feels more like that, then focusing more on what does it mean to shape the work? What does it look like to, to put the work into the format of a pitch where there's context around what, 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 what the demand side of this is, where there's a high level of what it looks like to actually do it, um, and there's some constraints around like time and so on. That's, that's one approach. So focusing more on shaping and pitching and, and improving those skills. The other thing can happen where it says actually, look, I think we are quite close with the way that we're sh shaping work. I think the way that we're defining the work is very good. But what we're discovering is that we, we can't actually make progress two weeks at a time. And we actually need to figure out how to give ourselves bigger chunks of time and, and actually more collaboration as well. Because the other mm -hmm. thing is that mm -hmm. um, a big difference if we look at shape up versus something like Scrum is that the team, there isn't a, a, an initial session where some kind of master mm -hmm. of the process divides the work into tickets, mm -hmm. that actually the work is given whole to the team. And then the team is collaboratively dividing that work into scopes and then tackling those scopes over the six weeks. So this can be a situation where one can say, actually, we would like to we would like to have more collaboration during the build effort, and we would like to give people uh, a bigger box to work in instead of this two-week box. And in that case, we see teams actually just starting with the jump over to six-week cycles and then gradually iterating on the way that they actually give the input to that team, which is the shaping and, and the pitching. Mm -hmm. Great. So it is possible, even for mere mortals. Of course, yeah. Actually, I'm quite surprised by the underground adoption that I see, you know, yeah. I see messages trickling. Oh yeah. It's, um, it's really interesting. You know, one of the funny things about this world is nobody wants to go on the internet and say, I don't know how to organize the way our company does development. Mm -hmm. Right. Who's, mm -hmm. who is going to do that? Who's going to go onto a public forum and be like, I am the VP of engineering and my team can't ship. Right. Or I'm the lead of, I'm the head of product. And I keep and my projects keep spiraling out of control or I give it to the engineers and what comes back never matches my intent. Nobody goes on the Internet and says that. Right. And so everybody thinks like, oh, la, 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 like everything's fine, you know, but there's a lot of struggle kind of under the surface, you know. And so what I'm seeing is actually um, a lot like I get a lot of emails all the time from people who are uh, struggling with this, um, but the forums you just, it's just crickets, you know, and people aren't, mm -hmm. and, and very often a lot of the kind of discussion that happens online um, is, uh, is more at the level of engineers and, and product managers who are trying to trade techniques, you know, yeah. and for them, there's actually very little downside to talking about how, is there a better way that my team can work? Cause it, it's actually mm -hmm. not their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. see a lot of buzz about methods from people who are actually one level below the decision making that we're talking about here. And for the folks who are really the decision makers, it's all happening on a black market of word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Or in CTO craft. <laughs> There's actually, certainly been some discussions about it there. So. Oh, that but sounds like you. you see, I, I, I haven't had the pleasure to, 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 to check it out yet, but it sounds like you've actually created exactly a kind of environment for that type of a conversation. So actually that exactly. sounds great. Yeah. All right, so let's have a look at Timo's question here, which is, is slightly different. How would you fit the shape up process into a quarterly based OKR cycle? Uh, yeah, so here a way to think about this is actually that the, uh, the cycles, these roughly six week cycles, you can think of them as a harmonic of the quarterly process. So there's some kind of a process that's happening at a larger scale, at a larger time scale where the business is having a conversation about what, what targets are we trying to meet, what are the important metrics and so on. And then there's a, the challenge is, is to, and the opportunity is to turn those objectives that come up at the quarterly level into outcomes that can be produced at a lower scale, 
right? Mm -hmm. And going straight from a quarter down to a two week cycle is actually is actually not very clear. That's a pretty big jump. But going from a quarter down to a five week cycle or something like that, depending on how long your cool week cool down is, I've seen a number of teams do that where they do a five week cycle and then they sometimes do a one week or two week cool down between. But they find a way to to align that that cadence so that it snaps into the larger um, that larger cadence that, that higher order cadence of the of the planning and then something like the what you say the okr or some kind of an overarching metric that becomes an input to shaping so we say what are the projects that we could shape that are going to produce a change in the business that has a causal relationship to that number right so now what we're doing is we're saying i need to take work from the metric level down to the to the sort of problem and outcome level Right. And if I can shape a project that's going to do that, then how do I turn that down into the kind of scope of work level of what are we going to go do over the next mm -hmm. week? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and then that actually needs to get turned all the way down into the actual end product level of what's the code that I'm going to try to write and what are the unexpected API endpoints and blah, 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 old legacy code I'm going to run into today. Right. So really seeing it as a stack at different levels of abstraction and figuring out how do I take requirements down to to shape sort of the outer boundaries but then how do i leave the middle empty for the for the people actually doing the work to find out the details and to resolve the unexpected conflicts that are going to appear there mm -hmm. excellent uh, we have an another question about scaling um from david uh, so if it's not about time but complexity so his example there is building a car with hundreds of teams so what about scaling there? And I guess the, the word there is dependencies as well. How can you deal with dependencies between different teams? Using we have scaling? a word, we, we have a, a technical word in the industry for dealing with dependencies. And that word is design. I know it's a dirty word ever since the 1990s have passed us behind, you know, uh, but uh, uh, actually, we are discovering that there is a need for such a thing as design. And um, we, you know, so what we actually need to do is say, how can I make some decisions at a certain level of granularity about what is, what is the, what are the factors of the system and what are the main interdependencies of the system? And then in order to work on those things, we have to isolate a piece, just like we do. And as I mean, we're, we're talking in CTO craft. So people here know about separation of concerns. They know about ortho orthogonality. They know about encapsulation and all these different principles. It's no different in, in terms of how we run the business, in terms of how we plan projects. It's all the same stuff, just happening at a slightly level, higher level of description. So here, we, we, we can't just dive straight into the code, right? Because we're gonna get lost. And at the same time, um, we, 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 we can't just sort of say, we're gonna go pursue this giant project. Like we need some kind of idea of how the hip bone connects to the leg bone. And then we're going to kind of do targeted digs down. You know, we're gonna do spikes down where we're going to implement different things in order to learn all the unknowns that we can't see from that higher level. And we're gonna come back up and then we're gonna say, uh huh. I've looked at how those things connect. I've understood what's possible here. This part of the system design, we are confident about, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then uh, I think a lot of the art of um, kind of shaping work is actually figuring out what are, the th what are the basic things that we can determine at a higher level that we're confident we can go after? And still, how do we leave room inside of those efforts for the details to shake out, to be to be worked out by the team, because we don't have a crystal ball, we can't foresee how all of those different you know pieces of, of implementation are going to come together. But some of them, we do have to understand how they're going to come together, right? So there has to be some some level of system design uh, happening up front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, now we have a slightly different question from Birgit here. So this is a little bit away from from the shape up or maybe the answer is shape up but what would you suggest someone who's just started as a cto does mm. you know the, the one thing that has really surprised me over the years is how how many sided uh the the, the this role is uh i if you had asked me that 
um, you know, 10 years ago or something like that, I might have tried to give you a very functional answer. Uh, well, this has to get solved and that has to get solved and this has to get put in place. And um, one thing that I'm seeing is that there's a, there's a huge uh, 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 people aspect to this. There's a big soft skills aspect to this. Mm -hmm. There are um, major questions about um, what does the integration look like at the sea level? What does the interoperation look like between product and engineering, for example? Um, and uh, uh, the other thing is that I haven't, I haven't sat in the CTO role. I've always been someone who is kind of the glue in between these different roles. And so the, the best advice I could give is actually to seek out a CTO who has some experience and tug on their ear a little bit and show them, you know, show them your, your curiosity, show them your, your interest and your brightness and uh and and see what you can learn from someone who has the experience you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's a it's a it's a very it's a there's there's a lot of uh, pieces to it and of course it's also totally different depending on the context you're in but somebody who's been through a similar situation can can guide you best yeah yeah and i think i did i just did i just create an advertisement for the cto craft again it sounds like you probably, might have done yeah <laughs> probably the a lot of the i would imagine that a lot of what's happening in this group is 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 the networking that enables those types of relationships right where people would like yes. to get to know each other and find out who can learn what from whom yes and also because cto is a such a, a broad role it can be from kind of co-founder of two people or you could probably be one person and call yourself a cto to mm -hmm. you know, having thousands of reports so exactly it can be so yeah. different yeah and the the challenges change from the role to the size and so on so Yes, I mean, some of the things we offer, like mentoring circles, are more formalized ways for people to share their knowledge, but there's free discussion as well. So, as you say, it's mm -hmm. all, all within the scope of, of CTO Craft. Okay, um, so I had I saw a question here about um, how have you seen good shape up implementations affecting the accelerate metrics? Are you aware of the? the the four accelerate metrics change lead time no. deployment frequency mean time to restore and change fail percentage no um, accelerate metrics is something that i haven't spent time with but if if uh uh I, i'd welcome them to restate the question if there's something that i could you know if they'd like to do some other way that i could get into the question you know but i don't know about these particular... I, yeah so um accelerate metrics are about uh improving the effectiveness of um software development so the the thesis is that these are the four most important metrics um so i suppose more generally the question is how can shape up implementations maybe not only affect the quality but is there a way they can mm. kind of affect the throughput of work as well i see i see well, yeah when i look at those metrics listed individually what i see are efficiency metrics mm -hmm. um yeah, and right. uh and actually, the thing is that very often what we see in well in, in well tuned, um, uh, agile type environments is uh, is a high efficiency. If you think in terms of kind of a, a piece of work getting defined and then something getting deployed, you can see a lot of you can see the wheel turning a lot. But often we actually don't we actually honestly see a lot of rework, <laughs> a lot of rework happening like over yeah. time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's not yeah. a lot of um, we, 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 we talked about the work, we went and built it and everybody was smiling and popping champagne afterward. There's not a lot of that. Right. And so what I would really say is that shape up is about champagne moments. Mm -hmm. What are the, when are the, what are those moments where we should pop champagne together and say, we accomplished something that was strategically important and everyone is happy with the time frame that we spent with how we spent our time getting, not, not getting to. You know, it's not a question of how long since the last deploy. It's a question of, did we deploy something that was meaningful to the business? And how do we feel mm -hmm. from a business point of view mm -hmm. of the time that elapsed from the conception mm -hmm. of that to the deploy of that? That's a very, very different metric. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a focus may be more on developing the things that really give pleasure to the, the users and that maybe really create value rather than just churning out the next feature Interesting. yeah i would and and i would i would tie it directly to the business i would say because the thing is that um a lot of the times you know we have a um 
there's been a big push for everyone to talk more about experience. But the thing is that experience is still in the service of business outcomes. And it's, it's never the experienced people who get to make resource allocation decisions. They are always fighting for, please listen to us, the experienced people. Please let us make it more delightful, right? They're not the ones who are uh, holding the schedule. Um, it's always actually the business people um, who, who have more influence over how much time should really get spent on something. Um, and so really what I, I view the whole process of shaping work and trying to define what's the outcome we're trying to reach as starting, starting with a problem that's valuable to the business, saying how much time is it worth to the business to spend on this thing? And then within that time box, you know, of what it's worth based on the outcome, let's, let's get design and engineering together to design something that's going to be effective both from a front end perspective, from an experience perspective, and from a from a uh, from an implementation perspective. Uh, in terms of the the questions coming in, so I don't seem to have the ability to mark them as answered. So I'm I'm seeing lots, <laughs> and it's a bit difficult. Uh, be helpful if you. Yeah, it's can, funny. I also uh, don't. I also don't see that. Maybe the people do it themselves. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so if your question's answered and you can mark it as answered, that would be great. And also, if you can vote on the ones that you find most interesting, they should pop to the top of my my list. So that would be that would be helpful. Um, right. Let's let's pick a, another one. Oh, they're moving all over the place now because people are voting. Here's one about. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. We answered the first one there, Timo's, right? So the second one I see is from Nathan here. So traditional agile attempts to provide, whoops, it's moved as I'm reading it, provide cadence predictability for a team. Is this still a goal for shape up? Mm. Well, um, I, I like to think of it um, less as a less as a question of whether the cadence is a goal and more about when does cadence help and how does cadence help? So we can take it out of the um, outcome box and put it into the into the action box of what are the things that we do to get the outcomes we want you know um, uh, one thing that um, that can be difficult is as you start to have more people it can start to become difficult to actually figure out who's available when to work on what and mm -hmm. uh, part of the problem of shaping work isn't just about the amount of time we want to spend on something. It's also about how do we shape the work so that it matches the knowledge and expertise of the available people. You know, different people in an engineering organization have knowledge of different parts of the system. They have uh, sort of, uh, you could say, kind of authority to make different levels of change, right? There are some people who you wouldn't blink if they were to suddenly change the data, rip up the database schema and make some changes there. And there are other people who you would rather stay within the existing schema. And, you know, there, there, so there, there, there's questions of what kind of, what kind of skill and knowledge does this work require and who's going to do that? And if, if, if finding people's availability involves playing calendar Tetris, then it's going to be very difficult from a strategic standpoint to actually get, gather the resources that you need, gather the people and the time and the skills that you need into the bundle to actually get that work done. So having a kind of a regular, um, you know, something like a six week cycle with a cool down in between, it, it, it's, it's one tool to uh, uh, introduce some regularity into the availability of people. How do people pool in and out of projects so that as different type of work comes up that we can actually kind of more easily solve the resource allocation problem. That's kind of what that's about. One thing I would mention is that um, cadence uh, uh, also assumes uh, that all of the people involved are within the control of the same sort of scheduler. You mm -hmm. know, if if you're doing some integration work with a third party and you have to wait on them to to do their side of the integration or to give you feedback on the integration, then you're not going to be able to say that this is going to work in in cycles of work because you're going to be twiddling your thumbs waiting for the other side to become available or to give you what you need. And so when you're in a situation where you don't actually control the timing of the resources, mm -hmm. that's that's that should pull you over into the Kanban universe. The Kanban mm -hmm. was made for that. It was mm -hmm. made for I don't understand when things are going to come to me 
or when things are going to become available. So we're going to queue things up so that when the first possibility comes, we can kind of move forward, right? That's what that universe is all about. Mm -hmm. Versus um, what's what's described in Shape Up is is more about when I have everybody that I need to to go build something. I have the design ability. I have the technical people. Um, kind of how do we uh, uh, actually shape the project in the sen sense of time and, and, and team so that they can all work together uninterruptedly to get this outcome, you know? And in that case, the, the cycles can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And on a, a more kind of prosaic note, then if someone has a, a week's holiday or two weeks holiday, do you uh, um, assume that the, or at least give the team the option to work around that? Or do you kind of have to find someone else for the for that um, cycle? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, it's it's very much a question of uh, of the situation. You know, if you're coming into, let's say, you're coming into the beginning of a six week cycle, and you you understand in advance that someone's going to be out for a week, that would actually be a constraint on the. Um, mm -hmm. So we we have we have a word which is um, in shape up. We talk about uh, the bet, and to make the bet is to make that commitment of this work, this time, these people, you know kind of putting together, I sometimes to say, putting together the pill that everybody's going to swallow. You know, it's like the thing that we're all going to go do, right? And um, and uh, if you have that information in advance, then it's just a constraint, right? And maybe that person who's going to be out for a week um, uh, is playing a role in, 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 so for example, if the QA person is going to be out for a week, that's quite different than if the person who is leading the, the, the engineering side of it is going to be out versus, you know, whatever, right? There's a lot of variety there. The other thing is, of course, if somebody unexpectedly has to go out for a week, then mm -hmm. things happen. And you could stretch mm -hmm. the whole cycle for another week. You know, you can you can you can do whatever is reasonable. I I, I don't think it's very important to, um, if if all we have is the rules about the number of weeks and the the rituals, um, they don't actually get us very far. But if we understand about different types of work that happens in different phases. And what what is the output of shaping? Mm -hmm, and what mm -hmm. what kind what kind of work goes to the team as an input? And what activities did the team do to collaborate on that work? When we understand the mechanisms and the actual activities that take place, then we can always make adjustments to schedule and stuff like that because we understand how the engine works. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're in effect changing the odds slightly, right? If someone's unavailable, maybe the bet slightly less likely. So that's an interesting way of looking exactly. At it. That's that's a that's actually a really important piece of information that we collect when we're kind of shaping the bet, you know, or negotiating mm -hmm. the bet. You know, who's going to be around, who's going to be available, uh, because we want to always stack the things in our favor. And but in order to do that, it means we have to take a moment first and be intentional about it, and not just throw work into the into the agile machine and hope that it's all going to come out at high velocity, right? Mm -hmm. Because this actually doesn't have a clear connection to outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here about um, futures. So since you wrote the book, have you discovered other methods for designing at the right level of abstraction? So is there going to be shape up version two? Does the methods continue to evolve? What else uh, have you a, found out? There's actually a great deal of stuff uh, that is coming together now. And um, uh, the level that it's happening, there's it's, it's not a question of 1.0 and 2.0. It's a question of of actually level of concreteness, you know, uh, the book I think did a good job putting out some language and some key principles, right? The notion mm -hmm. of shaping, the notion of six week cycles, the notion of betting uphill, downhill, and so on. But what I'm seeing is that when it comes to actually implementing this stuff, there are many, many, many different actual practical, tactical things that you have to learn to be successful at it. You know, I've noticed, for example, that many teams, uh, don't have a, uh, they don't know how they break down work. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you actually take a project and turn it into work that engineers are going to go do? Usually everyone kind of hopes that the most senior engineer is going to be around and that they can do it. Right. And there's, there's, there's not a lot around a clarity around what is it, what does that actually entail and how do you do it? And um, uh, it, there's a, there's a, actually a key thing there, which is this, there's there's the level of what we think this project should be as a, as a kind of a pitch 
there's some level eventually of tasks that we've understood need to happen, like write the migration that adds this column, right? And then in between that, there's actually another level of something called scopes, which are kind of like, if you can take the whole effort and break it apart into eight or 10 kind of main components of implementation work, Mm -hmm. And those scopes are actually the things that kind of fill in with work. As we, as we start to get our hands dirty, all kinds of unexpected work appears. And this work is usually all in a black market because you can't put it into JIRA. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a moment of putting all the tasks into stone, but those are the imagined tasks, not the discovered tasks. Mm -hmm. And then once you actually get your hands dirty, you discover the real work, but there's no place to put it. There's no place to track it. Right. And then when product says, how is the project coming? There's no visibility because nobody can explain the state of the work, right? And so there's a, there is a whole lot of very concrete things that teams can do actually to, to, to be more successful in, in those different steps and actually to, to, to articulate how they do those things and to especially to teach, to teach the more junior people how to do that stuff. Because mm-hmm. if we just keep hoping mm-hmm. that the senior people are going to um, close their eyes and then have the magic intuition of how to separate the parts of the system. This is not going to scale. <laughs> and this is what we see over and over again, right? Is that um, actually the ability of the senior person to make kind of factoring decisions at a very high level of how we break the work apart is a major bottleneck as teams grow. So this is actually mm-hmm. something I've been doing a lot of work on that's a very fun to work on with, with technical people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that must be a real challenge, turning the kind of tacit knowledge into um, concrete knowledge that can be shared. It's it's so much fun. I really like it a lot. And we're actually making some amazing process, progress. I just mm-hmm. did a workshop for the first time, a prototype workshop, a prototype workshop, all about the process of kind of transforming a package of work at the pitch at the product level into scopes of implementation work. And how does that translation happen? And we're seeing amazing results. It's actually very exciting. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Good. We'll keep, we'll, uh, keep a, a lookout to hear more about that. Then. Yeah, I look forward to sharing more about it. Excellent. So another another question about comparing. I don't know. We all want to compare. I guess it's because we're technical people, right? But uh, how how does shape up mesh with uh, Marty at Kagan? I think isn't it uh, framework approach mm. to Kagan. products? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you um, have you seen it work and fail? Well, what I what I have understood is that um, Marty Kagan is sharing a lot of things that are very important and true at a high level about mm-hmm. the fact that product and engineering need to find ways to to cooperate with each other. And um, I think we're seeing more and more awareness at, at a higher level of how we kind of see a lot of this is this is the point where we all go draw a Venn diagram on the whiteboard, right? Where products and engineering and business are somehow happily coexisting, right? And yep. um, as far as I understand, he's he's done a huge service to the industry by kind of highlighting the need for, for this overlap and 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 getting people to talk about it more. The challenge for all of us who are actually inside of companies is to operationalize that. Mm-hmm. And and what it what it comes down to is not just kind of a uh, how do I kind of define teams or how do I delegate responsibilities or, you know, when do different roles overlap? It goes all the way down to when I'm in the room as a product person and I'm talking with a technical person and we're shaping what we want to happen at a product level. And we, we bump into something that we don't know if it's feasible at a technical level. How do we switch from mm-hmm. the shaping level to the spiking level of determining what's possible technically without that that spiking work running away as some tickets in engineering that becomes a giant discussion in a comment thread or slack or something that runs away from us how do we actually what are the questions we ask what are the techniques that we use when we're in a room to actually go from the shaping level to the spiking level to clearing up a technical unknown to going back to the strategic level what is the deliverable that we give and to whom and when? There are so many kind of concrete tactical things that we have to work out. And that's kind of more uh, the, the, the zone that I'm working in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at a high yeah. level, there's a lot of compatibility, but at, yeah. at a low level, actually, um, 
there, there isn't a lot on the market today about how do we actually do that shaping and how do we, what is the interaction between product and engineering actually look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. Like how do you mm -hmm. actually structure that interaction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it, I think there's also a question there without getting too sidetracked about how, um, how comfortable that relationship is, right? Because there should be, in my view, some kind of, tension in that right product would like to do mm. this technology yeah, totally. can deliver this yeah. at the cost of it so that's I, I, I yes it's a really important part and 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 also managing managing the tension that's naturally there because for example what you find is that very often from the product and business side we like to to say that everything is possible and mm -hmm. we like to imagine that everything is possible but from the engineering side kind of from a from a mindset uh, you know, uh, the engineers, the engineers will usually first tell you what you can't do, mm -hmm. right? Or why you, why you can't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you get them to agree to what you can do, and I also can relate because I'm, I'm a programmer as well. As soon as you relate to talk about what you can do, the scope spirals out because now we have to be logically consistent across all edge cases. Right. So you, you get this thing where it's like, it's really hard to actually um, draw some lines on the ground of what the scope you want to be is when the engineer is in the room. But then when you invite them, it's hard to pull the scope back because mm -hmm. they're already talking about they're already talking about compliance and QA and they're trying to pull in the senior engineer from this other department who runs the legacy system. And you're like, wait, 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 we're not ready for that yet. So there's there's a lot of uh, uh, specific uh, techniques that we actually need to apply together in order to understand what conversation are we having? Am I trying to get information about this or that? And how far does it go? And and when does it leave this room? And when does it not leave this room? You know, there's there's actually a, a dance there, uh, which uh, which we which can be learned. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, right. There's a question from Dushka here about uh, how does shape up compare again to no estimates? If you, if you know estimates, if you know no estimates. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know about no estimates, but the but to just hearing it gives me. A, I can only assume that it means somehow that estimates should happen less, or they're bad, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, not, and the thing I'm is, not look, familiar with it either. So. The thing is, look, you 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 cannot you cannot just go into something with no idea of what it entails, right? Uh, so so I think I think the answer can never be uh, 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 story points all day or no estimates. You know. Um, well, I think the, the thing that we need to do is look more at unknowns and knowns. Mm -hmm. Is the work something that we've seen before? Is mm -hmm. this architecture that we're integrating with something that's known to us, right? And then, and then we take a certain level of, of risk there versus if, there's, if it's something we haven't done before or we haven't done it in this context, then it has a different risk profile. So the, when we talk about appetite, um, appetite is a design mechanism, right? So that rather than going from a design to a number, we go from a number to a design. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's also a risk uh, mitigation, or what do you call it? Like it's a risk management technique. Because when we say, look, it doesn't matter what the truth of the code is. Strategically, this is not worth more than X weeks to the business. Yeah. You know, then uh, it means that there's a kind of a hard outer wall, right? And then the, the thing that we need to get good at is not, it's not about you know, estimating or not estimating. It's actually we have to figure out how to start to spot what are the things that we're confident in and what are the unknowns in a, bot, in a bundle of work. And then how do we actually sequence the way that we do that bundle of work so that we do spikes on the deepest unknowns first in order to, 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 to eliminate the most unknowns early on. When you look at what most junior programmers are doing, and when I say junior programmers, I mean effectively all programmers, because how many programmers existed five years ago, right? If you look at the number of programmers just in the industry, like nearly everybody is still learning, right? And uh, when you look at the the, the main um, kind of a, a way that 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 ju more junior programmers approach work is they start with what they know how to do, because mm -hmm. they want to show progress, right? And the thing is that uh, uh, what we need to start to train ourselves to do is is to figure out how do we identify the things that we don't know and then how do we how do we actually dig into those things earlier and then let that feedback on our decisions about the sequence of what we're working on mm -hmm. 
So a question from Aaron here about how do you deal with change after the bet has been made? It's an interesting question. So the question I would ask as a follow-up is, is, is what does it mean deal with change? Because sometimes what you see is that um, change means uh, what we thought about the implementation or turned mm -hmm. out to not be true. We thought mm -hmm. that we could plug A into B, but it turns out it's more complicated than that. That is a very different change than we thought that we were aligned to go do X, but now the CEO is tapping my shoulder and telling us that sales needs this other thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, those are very, very different things. Yeah. So I'm guessing if in the first case, you would then be looking at um, changing the scope of what you're going to do to fit in your time box. I guess, I mean, I'm guessing what what's behind the question, but I'm wondering if, if you kind of if is there a, ever the time to cancel a cycle because it just becomes not worthwhile or yeah i mean i know i guess i'm guessing because scrum is quite strict about rules for that and I, i'm guessing that's what's behind <laughs> it what, what you do in that yeah. kind of case where the the basis for the the whole cycle is changed well there's different there's different um degrees of what do you call it like how many red how many red alarms are wailing you know what i mean like if you're really in a crisis where uh, uh everything that you thought was true is turning out to not be true uh in the implementation mm -hmm. then somebody's going to actually have to pull the cord and say look we can't just continue with this effort because we don't understand what we're getting into we are just in the dark here and we we don't see the end of it we don't know what is connected to what uh, that that would be uh, an example of, of kind of pulling the circuit breaker and saying, look, this turned out to be so different implementation wise from what we thought um, that uh, that we need to reconsider actually what this project is actually about and make new trade offs. Right. So we have to bring product and business back in, inform them of the new reality. This is mm -hmm. eight. This is five times more complex than we thought. And maybe there's actually just a totally different way to solve the same problem that avoids mm -hmm. that that hairball uh, mm -hmm. or maybe maybe when we bring it back to business to say you know what it's worth it even if it's even if it's so complicated but let's do now let's do some spiking and then let's actually do uh some firming up on the shaping before we commit to a new effort to go do it so that we can get more clarity around those unknowns right so we we, we have a tactical response to it where we actually eliminate those unknowns instead of just throwing more time on it and hoping that it's all going to work out fine right so that's 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 a way of thinking about the big implementation unknowns if you're getting changes in terms of sort of what's important to the business or what's important in terms of the requirements from a kind of a product side after the after the quote bet was made then it, it would lead me to believe that probably there wasn't real alignment about the commitment of time with all the important stakeholders before the bet was made. People, what I'm noticing is a lot of people who adopt shape up actually use this word bet very loosely. And they mm -hmm. often just mean that we decided to start the project. But mm -hmm. really the thing that um, the thing that this is another area where I'm I'm really digging into a level of concreteness that wasn't in the book. The when the betting table is effective, it's actually a negotiation. It's the last stage of shaping. And it's a negotiation between the people who are going to give, be able to grant the engineering time, the people on the, on the let's say, sales side or business side who are going to agree not to ask for anything else in the next six weeks, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. a very different mm -hmm. kind of alignment to say, mm -hmm. I will not bother you because we have all decided that this is important, right? For the next six weeks or whatever it is, right? That's very different. Um, yeah. That's such a classic, uh, well, so common, isn't it? But um things get reprioritized oh we need to do this now and my question is always well so what are you not going to do in the next period it's like oh no we're well, going to do all that as well so it's like <laughs> yeah but here's the other thing too is that uh is that you know like a scrum and so on were designed for that that's mm -hmm. the reason why scrum exists was to it was to become robust to variation in demand the idea was our client is telling us something different every two weeks so let's only plan two weeks right and this is actually a defensive structure that was put in place by engineering teams against mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. right? When you look at the real practical context of it, and what we're talking about here is something where um, this is about business actually deciding or product, product and engineering designing together 
how are we actually going to ship the things that we think are important, right? And it, it has to do with actually coming to the same table and making negotiations together about how we're going to spend time. Well, Ryan, thank you very much for, for, for all of your answers. We're amazingly already at, at one hour, so it's it's been fascinating uh, talking to you and uh, certainly some really great experience and answers and, and a lot more detail about shape up. So uh, I'm sure more of our community will, will go on to use it. And, um, if, you know, we, we look forward to hearing from you when you have some more research. We'd love to hear it. Sounds really, really exciting. So thank you for, for spending this time with us. Uh, thank you to the audience as well for all the questions. I can see there's still a lot of unanswered ones. Um, but uh, we, we certainly did uh, did our best to, to answer the ones yeah. we could. So yeah, if anyone has something that I didn't answer to their satisfaction, or something is burning that I, we didn't get to, they can also just email me rjs at hey dot com. You'll also find my email on the uh, on the Twitter link there, or I can just put it into the chat. You can probably RJS type it in there. Yeah. Com is my email. Okay. So feel free to just write me with questions there, because I'm always interested in hearing kind of what people are struggling with and and uh, and what can be clarified. Excellent. So, yes, thanks again for all the attendees. So we're taking a break for Christmas and the New Year. So we'll see you all again in 2022. Take care, all right, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks for having me.